Society. We're the student affiliate chapter of the American Chemical Society, and we do a lot of cool things like this, so you should join, first of all. Um, yeah, and thanks for coming. Also, if you didn't get pizza or want something to drink or want more either, we have plenty up there. Um, and with that, I'm actually going to turn it over to Nick, who's going to be our MC for tonight. Yay! Hi everyone, I'm Nick Reiser. I am the Public Relations and Social Director of the New Chemical Society. I'd like to welcome you, you to So You Think You Can Demo. Tonight you'll be wowed and amazed by science. We have four wonderful contestants who are here to try to explain a scientific principle to you. So the general setup of tonight's evening will be there are four contestants. They will each do one demonstration followed by an explanation and a question and answer session by the judges. With that, I'd like to introduce our judges for tonight. We have Mike Zeman, the Director of Outreach and Science Engagement, the Everett College of Science. We have Todd McPherson, the Science Coordinator for State Area, College, uh, State Area School District, State College Area, excuse me. And we have Dr. Tom Luke, Professor of Penn State. <laughs> So, yeah, also and, oh, and, excuse me, sorry, <laughs> last minute addition, we have Zach Reitz, who was our winner last year, he is a senior uh, chemistry major, and he's housebroken. Uh, so, tonight we will have the judges' prize and the uh, people's choice. Each one of you will vote at the end of the four contestants. And whoever has the most votes will win the People's Choice, and the judges will have their own separate vote. Simple enough. All right, so to get started, we would I'd like to introduce our first contestant, Gino. <laughs> Gino is a freshman chemical engineering major, and tonight he will be doing a demonstration about superconductors. So I'll turn it over to Gino. Thanks, Nick. All right, so I'm going to try to explain to you the magic behind superconductors. Um, I saw them in my, my Chem uh, 112 class, and there was a pretty interesting demo, so I thought it would be cool to show you. First of all, what is a superconductor? Well, a lot of things conduct electricity, metals that we use you know, throughout our houses with wiring and stuff. But a superconductor is a metal or alloy that has zero resistance below a certain temperature, and it also expels the magnetic field. And some reasons for using them, a lot of times in wires, whenever, even if it's just a regular conductor like something in your home, it still has a type of resistance and a lot of the energy that goes through them is wasted and, uh, as thermal heat um, through the wire. So the point of zero resistance, we want to have zero energy loss. So you spend less money. Um, some causes for energy loss, and this is kind of exactly what's happening. The electrons are bouncing off the atoms as they go through the material. But a way to remember it is uh, imagine you're in a, in a crowd of people, OK? And you try to walk through the crowd of people. If they're, if they're moving around, you're going to be bumping into people. Um, you don't want that. So if you take it down to a low temperature and you freeze them, then you can walk straight through without bumping into them because they're moving. So that's what's happening whenever you lower a superconductor below a certain temperature. Um, like I said, you're taking away the kinetic energy, so therefore the electrons will have an easier path throughout the, through the material. And each material or, uh, has a superconducting transition temperature, uh, the point where it has zero resistance. Um, a lot of metals, uh, good conductors actually don't have a superconducting transition temperature. They just, they approach uh, zero resistance, but they never actually quite hit it. A lot of good insulators, such as what I'm going to be using, they have a superconductor transition temperature. Um, in this graph, normal metals, um, ones that can't achieve superconductivity, they don't really ever reach zero uh, resistance. But superconductors, once they reach that certain temperature, they have zero resistance. And it's normally really cold, but they're called high temperature superconductors. Um, but really, it's like um, the one I'm going to be using has to reach a temperature of 95 degrees Kelvin, which is really cold. Here's some common ones. The first one ever discovered was mercury in 1911. Um, someone put it in liquid helium, and that's four degrees Kelvin, just four degrees above absolute zero. 
Um, a cool thing about this that I'm going to demonstrate is the Meisner effect. And with these superconductors, let me switch here. No, I won't switch it. Um, whenever you put them above a magnet, whenever they reach their superconductor transition temperature, they'll actually float above the magnet and they're trapped. Um, a regular, let me show you. I have the superconductor right here. It's just, it's a uh, yttrium, barium, copper oxide. Whenever it's not uh, below its transition temperature, it's just a regular material. There's nothing to it. It's just, it's a ceramic. So it doesn't have any magnetic properties. Um, it will have some resistance though. But whenever you take down below this temperature, the, mag the uh, flux will actually, the magnetic field will actually go around and it will totally avoid the superconductor. And that's what I'm going to demonstrate here with my demonstration. And again, I'm using liquid nitrogen to cool down the superconductor below its uh, superconducting transition temperature of 95 degrees Kelvin. So let me go and do that. Safety first. This stuff's really cool. Literally. All right, so this is liquid nitrogen, 77 degrees Kelvin. I'm going to take the superconductor over here, and I'm going to cool it off for a few seconds in the liquid nitrogen. So just got to give that a few seconds to uh, reach its, its TC, or its temperature that becomes a superconductor. Shouldn't take too long. I should have done this before I started. Let's see if it's cool enough. And there you go. It's actually trapped above the magnet and you're able to move it around. It's, it's really fun to play with. Wait, let me, let me see if I can do this. Being that it's trapped, you should be able to flip it upside down. And you can see it's frozen in, in uh, above the magnet. And then if you put it on a round magnet, You can spin it around. Pretty cool. And then eventually it will go back, to, it will increase in temperature and it won't be able to uh, continue let, uh, being trapped above the magnet. So I'm going to set that off. Yeah! <laughs> And then some uses, or this is the uh, crystal structure of it. And then some uses of them, they're being used in uh, maglev trains, and these things reach over 300 kilometers per hour. I'm not exactly sure how fast that is in miles per hour. Um, it's used in the Large Hadron Collider, the particle accelerator at CERN, and they're trying to use them for more efficient wiring, so uh, less energy loss. And are there any questions? <laughs> Next up we have Caroline, she's a freshman chemistry major and she loves hanging out with the Nidin Chemical Society, the coolest club on, club on campus. Please help me welcome Caroline. And today she will be doing the classic uh, demonstration, elephant, elephant toothpaste. So I'll turn it over to Caroline now. <coughs> Um, and it's called that because it gets very foamy and it looks like toothpaste, but it's also very big, so you can't really brush your teeth with it because it'd be much too small for you, so obviously it's made for elephants. Um, so first off, we're going to start with 100 milliliters of 30% hydrogen peroxide. So I'm just going to pour this in. Thanks. 
So we have our 100 mils. Uh, next I'm going to put in just some normal dish soap that you would buy at the store. That's good. Uh, next, secret ingredient food coloring, because that's what makes it awesome. And last but not least, the most important thing, Ki, which is potassium iodide, this is going to be the catalyst of the reaction. So hydrogen peroxide will decompose naturally by itself, but it takes a long time. Um, so the Ki, specifically the iodide ion, is what speeds up the reaction. So add this, and you get a lovely little reaction. <laughs> so the soap made it kind of yellow, and uh, obviously the food coloring made it rather pink. And it just keeps expanding and expanding and expanding because the reaction is um, the hydrogen peroxide decomposes into oxygen gas and water. So all these bubbles are from the oxygen gas uh, getting trapped inside the soap. So the soap helps to form all these awesome bubbles. And it goes on for a good while. <laughs> so, and it's also an exothermic reaction, so I don't, you probably can't see it here, but there's some steam coming out of it, so it's uh, pretty warm too. And it gets really messy. <laughs> so, yeah, it'll go on So this is just another explanation of the reaction. It's about finished now. Um, hydrogen peroxide decomposes naturally into water and oxygen. Ki is a catalyst that rapidly increases the rate of decomposition. Uh, the soap creates bubbles that trap the oxygen that's produced, and it's an exothermic reaction. Um, this can also be reproduced with yeast and many transition metal compounds um, that will also work as catalysts. And basically anything that decomposes hydrogen peroxide that works as a catalyst for the decomposition is known as a catalase. So yeah, any questions? So next up we have Ye Young with the chelate effect. Ye Young is from Korea and her favorite cartoon character is Pooh Bear. Ye Young. which is 400 to 430 nanometers wavelength. And in chemi chemi in chemical complex, a certain wavelength of soap to the complex, and complex appear the complementary color of absorbed wavelength. So Pooh absorbed purple light and reflect the yellow light so he is yellow Pooh Bear. <coughs> so here is Nicole Sophie. It's pretty green color. And I'm gonna add some chemicals to here to make color change. Um, this is green color because it reflects green color and absorbs the red, white, red wavelength. So here, this is the same and I want to add this one, natural carbonate. He 
it has cloudy white precipitate and this precipitate is this precipitate is nickel carbonate nickel from nickel sulfate and carbonate from sodium carbonate Neutralization. It means the acid react with base, and the acid re react with carbonate ion to form H2O and carbonate gas. So next, I want to add ammonia. This is ammonia <coughs> oxide. And add this to here.
here. Blue color. Uh, it's hard to see the purple color because so I'm gonna add EN to EN and EPA to little ones. Especially stable compound. 
It is called chelate effect. In the end, the driving force of solid formation took all of nickel ion out of solution and break up the chelated complex. So we can, so we can, we have a power to shift, shift the equilibrium in any direction, and what we can make color change to using different regions and different molecules. Thank you. Right, so our final presentation of the night will be from Francie. She is from State College, uh, Pennsylvania, right here. And tonight, she will be doing a demonstration called Shot Me Down. Chevy Cobalt. <laughs> now. Yeah, so we're going to tally your votes up once you finish them. And then in, while we take, while we count up your votes, we'll have a short little demonstration by our celebrity judge, Zach Wrights. <laughs> Um, yeah. I'm sure most of you have seen 
or played with it before, but um, if you haven't, dry ice is not ice at all. It's actually solid carbon dioxide. And the reason why it's called dry ice is that it doesn't melt. All it does is sublime, so it goes directly from a solid to a gas. Uh, this makes it very useful for packing if you have to transport cold materials because you don't have to worry about the water from normal ice getting everywhere. And also, you can store things at a colder temperature. Dry ice uh, sublimes at negative 78 degrees Kelvin, which is negative 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, whenever dry ice is dropped into water, 